Hello, thanks for coming to today's video. Uh, as you can see in the title, we're going to be discussing renal cell carcinoma. So, uh, first thing I want to mention about renal cell carcinoma is about 90 to 95% of neoplasms found in the kidney are renal cell carcinomas. So, pretty much it's so common that if you see, uh, if you do have a tumor in the kidney, it's going to be renal cell carcinoma. So uh, first let's talk about what it looks like on gross uh, specimen. So here we have a kidney which has been uh, kind of sliced in half right here and you have the you know right side of the kidney here and the left side there. Um, and so you can see here what I'm going to outline here is um, this is the actual tumor here. And so you know so the slice has actually sliced the tumor in half and so you can see it's kind of generally like a large uh, solid type of uh, mass. So um, that's pretty much what the uh, cancer looks like. And here um, it's going to be in the superior pole, uh, but that's not necessary. It could be found even in the inferior pole, in the uh, middle of the kidney, you know, wherever. So um, it could be anywhere throughout the kidney. However, it is uh, on histology, microscopic histology, it is associated with the proximal renal tubular epithelium. So that's where the kidney most uh, sorry the kidney the tumor uh, arises from so that epithelial type of cells over there so what we'll talk about now is going to be risk factors um, and the main risk factor that we're going to talk about is going to be the same for you know many things related to the kidney and that is smoking smoking increases the risk by 12 times and one third of cases of renal cell carcinoma have been uh, associated with smoking so smoking is a big risk factor which is also goes for you know bladder cancer and other types of uh, cancers related to the kidney. Um, next is going to be uh, obesity. Um, obesity is one of the uh, causes. Um, so here, let me try this again. Obesity and hypertension are one of the causes. In particular, it's uh, common in women. So that's another uh, known risk factor for renal cell carcinoma. Um, thirdly, we do have occupational exposure. These are people who work in certain industries uh, and they get exposed to certain chemicals like uh, tri trichloroethylene, um, benzene um, type of uh, derivatives, uh, herbicide, so people may be working in the fields, and vinyl chloride is another one. So people working in or around these types of chemicals uh, do tend to get renal cell carcinoma and that's just because the kidneys are responsible for a lot of times to uh, excrete the you know waste that comes from this and so it can sometimes get concentrated. Um, there are also some drugs associated, in particular phenacetin, which is no longer prescribed, but uh, you know historically that's significant. Long-term dialysis, uh, what that does is that can increase your risk of, of um, cystic disease, and that in turn can lead to renal cell carcinoma. So that's how long-term dialysis does that. And also uh, renal transplants, that's another cause of uh, renal cell carcinoma, can increase that risk. Now, um, besides these risk factors, there are some genetic syndromes or familial syndromes associated with renal cell carcinoma. Um, the first one is going to be uh, von Hippel-Lindau um, disease, and this is uh, a gene that is found on the 3P chromosome. And so what happens is the 3P chromosome um, does translocation with either chromosome 6 or chromosome 8. Um, and so this chromosome is responsible, you know, when this translocation occurs, this increases something called hypoxia inducible factors, which increases angiogenesis, in particular the uh, vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF. And so with this increased angiogenesis, uh, that can eventually lead to formation of tumors. Now, von Hippel Lindau is not only associated with um, increased risk of renal cell carcinoma, but it's also associated with uh, pheochromocytoma. Uh, pancreatic cysts and also islet cell tumors, so both in the pancreas. Um, you also have retinal angioma, so it can affect the eyes as well. And you know, finally, you can also have um, uh, CNS hemangioblastoma. So that's another cause. And there's a few more. It's I mean I don't think it's, uh, it's pertinent to write all of them here, but this kind of gives you an idea of the other syndromes associated. Um, the next one we're going to talk about uh, hereditary renal cell carcinoma. Actually sorry, hereditary papillary renal carcinoma. Um, this is an autosomal dominant condition. Um, it's, it's a mutation in the MET gene, um, and this is a germline mutation which causes problems in the tyrosine kinase domain, and so that gives you unregulated growth. 
Um, and typically what patients will have is bilateral, multifocal, papillary renal carcinoma. So uh, these are one of the only times you can get them on both sides in you know, multiple positions. Uh, Bert hogg doop syndrome. Uh, this is another one. Um, this causes bilateral uh, multifocal as well. But instead of papillary renal cell carcinoma, it causes oncocytoma, which is not as bad. Uh, it's actually, they really metastasize. Um, it can also cause hereditary cutaneous syndrome. Um, and interestingly enough, it can cause tumors of the hair, which is also known as fibrofolliculoma. And, you know, on top of all this, um, it has other tumors as well. Uh, you know, it can affect the pulmonary system, even leading to pneumothorax, uh, renal tumors that like we talked about, and even colonic tumors. So, um, you know, very diverse set of uh, symptoms in uh, that category. So let's talk about clinical. Um, what will the patient have? Uh, what symptoms, symptoms will they complain about? Uh, you have three main symptoms, uh, such as flank pain, uh, hematuria, and flank mass. Now, um, flank pain and hematuria both occur in about 40% of cases, and the flank mass uh, is going to be about 25%. Now, all three of them together, though, it's not that common. It's only 10% of the time. So you, you're not going to necessarily have all these three symptoms together. And when, you know, if you do have all these three, even though they're uncommon, that probably suggests a very advanced disease um, once you do get all three of these. So uh, you know, one or the other can still be, uh, if one is missing or two are missing, you, know, you still want to take this into consideration. However, um, with this said, um, 25 to 35% of patients may remain completely asymptomatic. And so it'll be kind of just an incidental finding on a CT or um, you know, something like that. So um, besides those three kind of cardinal symptoms, there are other symptoms which are related to the cancer. Um, this could be anywhere from weight loss, uh, fevers associated with it, night sweats, um, you know, patients tend to have uh, malaise, and varicocele can develop because um, you know the renal vein is involved there. Now, on top of all these, um, there are you know the renal cell carcinoma has very classic perineoplastic syndromes. So it's kind of like the uh, small cell carcinoma of the lung, uh, in the fact that it produces a lot of uh, kind of aberrant hormones. So the first one is it increase it can produce too much EPO, uh, which is um, erythropoietin that can lead to polycythemia. However, anemia is also uh, does occur in renal cell carcinoma, so you don't need to always uh, have that. Um, if there's increased production of renin, that can lead to hypertension. And in general, you can have hypercalcemia and even polyneuropathy. Now, um, one interesting syndrome that's associated with renal cell carcinoma is called the Schoffer syndrome. Now, the Schoffer syndrome is uh, pretty much all it, uh, all it is is the patient... Uh, who has renal cell carcinoma also starts to develop hepatic dysfunction. And this hepatic dysfunction is not related to metastasis. So it's called a non-metastatic hep hepatic dysfunction. So this is why it's important that you, you, know, you monitor the uh, renal, uh, sorry, the liver function with patients who have renal cell carcinoma, even if there's no signs of metastasis. So very, very important fact um, to remember there. Um, on uh, physical examination, uh, what can you have? Uh, one thing that you can see is a flank abdominal mass, and this is about 25%, like I mentioned earlier. And here is an image of uh, a patient who has this flank abdominal mass. And so you can see right over here um, how large that can be. Now, that's not necessarily a cancer. It could also be, you know, polycystic kidneys or something like that. But this is something that um, would get you thinking in that direction. Also, 30% uh, of patients, uh, when they present, they present with metastasis. So that's why, um, you know, you want to look at the lungs, you know, which is 45%, uh, uh, soft tissue, which is 36%. Um, you know, you also want to take a look for bone, liver, skin, and CNS. These are all locations where it can metastasize, that should be 45%, sorry. And so these are all locations where it can metastasize. Um, so now that we've uh, finished up the clinical aspects, how would you work up a patient? Um, the first thing you want to do is you want to run a few labs. Um, so these labs would be your analysis, of course, because you want to see for any hematuria or anything else that's going on. CBC, of course, um, you're looking for any polycythemia or anemia that may develop. Uh, you look at electrolytes because um, hypercalcemia is, um, and because you have the kidneys are involved, and so um, that can sometimes throw off the, ele uh, the electrolytes of the body. Um, renal profile tests. 
Um, again, liver function test, we talked about so, so first syndrome and serum calcium because hypercalcemia is a very common perineoplastic syndrome as well. So after you've done all the labs, um, then you want to start going into the uh, imaging. Um, the number one imaging test modality by far is the CT scan. That is definitely the procedure of choice. And so um, what you'll see here, let me uh, get an next CT scan. So what you see here, this is a CT scan of the abdomen. It's a cut section. And so uh, where the arrows are pointing and what I'm outlining right now is the actual uh, tumor. And so you can see it's um, very dark in color. Um, and so CT scan not only identifies a tumor, but it can also help differentiate a solid from a cystic mass because you do need to rule out um, you know, cystic um, kind of problems. It can also uh, help look at you know, nearby lymph nodes. It can look at the renal vein and even the inferior vena cava to see if there's been any invasion. And this is important in staging, uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. It can also help rule out angiolipoma, which can also, uh, you know, it's also important uh, differential that you need to take a look at. Now, what you also, you, you know, as far as doing CT, and um, you do want to do other imaging modalities, um, but that's for staging. So, for example, not only do you want to do uh, CT here, but you want to do uh, abdominal and pelvic uh, CT, uh, plus or minus IV contrast. Uh, you're going to want to do a chest x-ray looking for any um, lung metastasis, and you want to do a brain MRI, again, looking for metastasis. And this is completely for staging, so you want to see if there's any metastasis throughout the whole body. Um, after that, um, another uh, workup that you can do, um, that you probably consider part of the workup, is a biopsy and looking at the histology. So uh, histologically, there's five different types. The first one is the clear cell carcinoma, which is made up of 75%. And the reason why it's clear is because it has a lot of lipids and glycogen in it. And so um, that's going to be pretty much your most common uh, histological type. Um, then we have chromophilic and chromophobic, so the names are uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, chromophilic are most common with bilateral multifocal um, that we talked about earlier, and chromophobic is going to be most common with large polygonal cells. Um, then we have oncocytoma. Um, these are a particular variant which rarely metastasize. And finally, it can be collecting tubules. So you have these five uh, main histological types. I mean, I don't know if they're really important to memorize or anything, but it just, you know, it, it's, uh, it does have some prognostic um, applications. So um, after you've done the imaging, then we want to go into staging. Um, so stage one um, is where you have a kidney here, which is less than seven centimeters. So, so the length, so what I just kind of highlighted there is seven centimeters, and you can see the tumor is actually um, within the... Um, seven centimeter mark and so and it's going to be of course all within the actual kidney uh, in stage two um, the only difference is going to be it's going to be greater than seven centimeters so you can see that's seven centimeters and the tumor is actually larger than that so it just takes up a larger proportion of the kidney so um, just to summarize less than seven centimeters within the kidney is uh, stage one and greater than seven centimeters within the kidney is stage two um, when we get to stage three, um, then things will change a little bit. Um, this is when you start getting invasion. Um, so the first thing is you get it invades the uh, renal vein and uh, inferior vena cava. So you can see this uh, that tumor right there going all the way into the inferior vena cava in the, in the renal vein there. Um, it also can invade the uh, adrenal gland. Uh, that is also another possibility that will make it a stage three. Um, however, it does not invade the gerotus fascia, so it'll be above the gerotus fascia. That's a very important key difference between stage 3 and stage 4. And once you get into stage 4, it goes below gerotus fascia, so that's an important uh, piece to mention there. Um, it begins to, um, besides going there, it'll begin to invade some of the nearby lymph nodes, so you get invasion of the lymph nodes, and finally you get metastasis. Uh, to organs such as the uh, you know lungs and brains like we talked about earlier. Okay, so um, how are we going to manage this? Um, so management um, has a few different principles. Um, first, you're going to want to do surgical, um, and this can be you know to get, remove a localized a tumor, or it can be palliative uh, if it's already metastasized or you know it's uh, beyond um, repair. So the first thing you can do is going to be the partial nephrectomy. 
um, and this is primarily for stage one and sometimes stage two. So what you do is you cut a piece of the kidney right there, um, and then you take whatever pieces are left over and you bring them together and then you stitch them together. So that's pretty much what we're looking at. And this is um, gonna be primarily with stage one, sometimes stage two, but usually stage two is too big to do this. Um, second is gonna be a radical nephrectomy. So in a radical nephrectomy, you're not just taking a piece of even the kidney, you're taking out this whole area which I'm drawing, so all the way down to the ureter, to the iliac there, and then all the way up. So that whole area, everything will get removed in that. And so that includes uh, removal of the gerotus fascia with all its contents. Uh, of course, um, also removal of the kidney, um, and that is with, sorry, a second, with all the contents. Okay, then we have removal of the kidney, um, and that's with the adrenal gland. And you look through for the um, lymph nodes as well. And if there's any enlarged lymph nodes, you dissect it. So that is a radical nephrectomy. And again, this is going to be done, uh, you know, if it's stage um, two and three, depending on how bad it is. Um, finally, you can do what's called a paleo, uh, palliative nephrectomy, where you just take out the kidney. Um, and, and this is generally done in metas met metastatic disease. And you just take out the kidney, not because you're trying to remove the disease, but it can help alleviate some of the symptoms, uh, such as pain. It can help alleviate some of the polycythemia and even the hypertension. So again, this isn't, uh, palliative nephrectomy is not you're trying to remove as much tumor as you can. It's more of you're just trying to limit some of these symptoms the patient may be experiencing. Um, after that, there is some adjuvant um, treatment that you can try um, you know, afterwards. Um, so there's a few here, so I'm just gonna go through them you know, just quickly. Um, first is gonna be the biologic uh, response mediator. So these are kind of things that change the uh, biologic response. Uh, this is interleukin-2 and interferon. Uh, and interleukin-2, pretty much all it does is activates T-cells and uh, natural killer cells. So uh, that's pretty much that. Um, there's also some new drugs which are, you know, molecular targeting certain, uh, certain I guess, products of the tumors. Uh, the first one is going to be seritinib. You also have uh, bevacizumab. Um, you also have uh, pazoponib. Um, and then there's also uh, temsirolimus and uh, sorafenab. And so, um, you know, so seritinimab and bevacizumab and puzapinimab is going to be VEGF um, and PD, uh, you know, platelet derived growth factor receptors and, and for uh, pazopomib. Um, tem, uh, temsirolimus is going to be a, an mTOR uh, inhibitor. And finally, serofenab is RAF kinase or VEGF as well, uh, inhibitor. And these are all inhibitors. Uh, so basically what these do is they block certain key mediators that the tumor uses to grow. And so um, they're very specific uh, for the tumors. And so they're uh, very popular right now. Um, chemotherapy agents can also be used. Uh, 5 4 uracil vinblastin, uh, paclitaxel is another one, um, carboplatin, one of the platinum drugs. Uh, I-phosphamide and gemcitabine. So these are just some chemotherapeutic agents, not really necessary to memorize, but I just kind of want to mention it just to be um, thorough. Uh, next, radiation. Um, the uh, renal cell carcinoma is not necessarily sensitive to radiation, but the brain metastasis are, so we tend to uh, use radiation for that. Uh, renal artery embolization, so what you do is you, um, you, know, you, you put in a, um, tract or you know, some type of wire into the uh, renal artery and then you try to uh, go to the specific artery that is supplying the tumor and you try to um, block the blood flow there in the hopes that it will kill the tumor. And so you can either inject um, ethanol, uh, you can inject some type of gelatin sponge uh, pledgelets as well. So these are the two things that they generally uh, insert. Sometimes they even, well I know for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, Sometimes you'll even just inject some type of chemotherapeutic agent, such as donorubicin. So it'll get it'll be in really high concentration for the uh, renal cell carcinoma. But I don't know if that they do that uh, for renal cell carcinoma. But they do do it for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And um, generally, this is also done done palliatively if you have a patient who is um, non-surgical. So you can't do surgery because of some uh, complication that they may have. So um, that is the discussion on renal cell carcinoma. 
Hope you guys uh, learned what you need to know and see you guys in the future video. Thanks.